Hi, I'm Michael Hill. I'm a forest firefighter from the United States of America. Welcome to my worldwide journey to explore man's fascination with wildfire. Australia is a big country, and fires have been around a long time here. I can think of nowhere else where fire mixes as much with people as it does right here in the Strait of Victoria. Victoria occupies just 3% of the Australian continent, but in the last 150 years, half the economic damage done by wildfire has been done right here in the state of Victoria. There are major fires every summer in Victoria. However, every 10 to 13 seasons, conditions come together just right. There's droughts, high temperatures, fuel buildups and these winds like this that cause fires to come together just right and they cause fires to just roar across the state. This is truly the place where fire meets the people. What makes Victoria so special in my eyes though is the way people have adapted here to live in such a fire prone environment. Every summer in Victoria over 60,000 Australians come together to fight fires. They're a special breed of people and I want you to meet them. I'm away to meet with Chris Carson. He's in charge of the CFA's Community Fire Guard program. Community Fire Guard is another Australian original, like the CFA's amazing backbone of volunteer firefighters. Today is a day of extreme fire danger and treacherous winds. So Chris has decided to meet me at the Urban Fringe, where the fire really does meet the people. Chris, can you tell me a bit about the Community Fire Guard? Um, Community Fire Guard started on the 10th anniversary of Ash Wednesday, yeah, so its program started in 1993. And it came from an acknowledgement basically that a community to be prepared for what they might experience so far doesn't need to be told what to do, they need to understand what they've got to do. Doesn't need to be told this is what's going to happen, they need to understand their own risk, they've got to own their own risk. So the whole idea of Community Fire Guard was that we had to meet people in their own homes, in their own local risk environment. We had to dress rather informally, um, and we had to talk in their language. And so we meet over a coffee table maybe with 10 or 15 people who all live in the same street. And it's a, a very, very slow process in the end, but we go through fire behavior. So they don't need me to tell them what's going to happen here. They could identify for me what their dangers are. They would go through some stuff on personal survival, um, how people lose their lives historically, um, and how people protect their lives, um, and how houses are lost in great detail. And it may take years um, for, for them to move through this process. But at the end, you end up with a program which is filled with people who are annoyingly enthusiastic about it all, but really know what they're talking about. And in the last 10 years, um, well, seven years or so, we, well, we've never lost a house in a community fire guard area to bushfire, um, though they've been in the thick of it. And um, they've all made their decisions about how they want to plan for fire, and they've got their equipment, and they help each other. And um, yes, the program's been very successful like that. Would you say that fire is one of the natural cycles? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this. This part of the world has evolved with fire for tens of thousands of years. Um, fire is a natural event and in the end what we say to the community is no matter what we do there's always going to be fires here. Sometimes it might be men, women and children that ignite them but there's lightning, there's a whole series of other things that ignite fires around here and this sort of forest needs fire. Um, a lot of our trees need, or a lot of our species, the seeds that are in the soil, they need fire to germinate. The seeds don't open until there's a fire going through them, um, which means that we might do, we might allow fire for a number of reasons. Okay, on a day like this, we don't want to see it, but say in autumn, in areas like this, some parts of this we like to burn because what happens is you get all the native species germinate. You get good grasses, native orchids, a lot of the shrubs come back, all that sort of thing, it regenerates the land. Um, so fire isn't 
just this sort of demon in this sort of area. On days like this, yeah, it is. But it's also a tool. That it's a part of this landscape, and without it, this landscape would become choked with trees and species that have never been here before, and ironically, possibly have a higher risk, um, more fuel, stranger fuels, than otherwise. But you've got to be careful, because if you as soon as you burn an area, if you burn it too regularly, what you're doing is you're encouraging species that like fire to germinate there. And the species that don't like fire stay away. So in the end, if you burn too regularly, you're actually evolving the landscape towards being fire prone. Chris, could you tell me a bit more about the bark? All the eucalypts have evolved differently. They're, they don't all look alike, um, they don't all burn alike, and they don't all have the same sort of bark on them either. Um, this one here, again, it's got fairly loosely attached bark. Um, and trees like this are pretty renowned for pretty intense short distance spotting. I mean, this oh, spotting again, this might go a kilometre, two kilometres, you know. It's taken off the tree by the wind, by the convection of the fire, the heat just pulls it off. Might just be smouldering and be thrown in front of the fire maybe a kilometre or two. But things like this, different sort of eucalypt this comes from and you can see that the bark is curled over and it's very, very good at long distance spotting because it protects, as it goes up in the air, that shape protects the burning parts so it doesn't burn out. Um, and this can go 10, 15 kilometers. Um, and so in the end you can have, we can't think of far in this sort of area as being a single discrete location. You've got bits of that landing a kilometre away in the grass around people's houses. You might have bits of this landing 10 kilometres away. Um, so when a fire really gets going in that sort of sense, the requirements for us in terms of how you even plan for this sort of fire um, are quite complex. And it takes a very large number of people, resources and so on. But that's also why, getting back to community fire guard, why people have to be self-reliant. Um, Obviously, shrubs like the tea tree we have here. Not a lot of spotting from something like this. Um, there's no embers going to be from this, but believe me, this is euphemistically known as petrol bush. This stuff burns very hot, very green. There's a, um, a lot of oil in it. Um, and the way it's built, it burns very, very well. And um, it smells quite extraordinary. Yeah, it smells like tea tree oil. Yeah, yeah. There's, a lot of, there's a lot of oil in that, but... Yeah. Um, it doesn't give us a problem with embers, it gives uh -huh. us a really big problem with the amount of heat it gives off very fast uh -huh. and clouds of very black smoke because of the oil in it. Around us there's a lot of fuel that's going to burn for a long time so being exposed in the open as we are, um, it's not the ideal place to be so we'd want to be leaving this area pretty rapidly uh -huh. and we'd want to be going to an area with reduced fuel uh -huh. because we know there's going to be the, any fire in that area is not going to burn so hot or even the far side of the slope there where it's downhill because we know that whilst the fire may go faster on this gentle upslope and burn hotter, every 10 degrees that it's going down, it halves its rate of spread and it halves its intensity. So the downhill side is something that we'd um, be wanting to see as well. It also find up along the road um, if you really needed to, because radiant heat, this heat coming out of here, goes in straight lines, just like sunburn. Anyone who's had sunburn understands radiant heat. It goes in straight lines, but it doesn't pass through solid objects. And so what we might try and do is we try and get out of the direct line of the radiant heat. And so on the edge of the road up there, if we really had to, there's a gutter we might use. Ideally though, you know, we may place our cars somewhere where there's no fuel to burn and shelter below window level in the car. And though the radiant heat will go through the windows of a car, um, if we're shield, um, if we're below the level of those windows, um, we're using it as an effective tool to protect ourselves. It's not the ideal place to be by any stretch of imagination. The ideal place to be is probably a good kilometre or so, that direction where it's all grass um, and where we've got a much better chance um, of um, knowing what we're going to experience for a start. Um, it's what we would call a safe anchor point. If you're caught in the open, you really would be making use of every natural feature you can to shield yourself from that radiant heat. Um, that might be a large log lying horizontally. I can't see one nearby, but a large log lying horizontally and lying on the side of that. Because we know that the, far, the fine fuel down here burns faster than the heavier fuel on this tree. 
And so sheltering behind a large heavy log, you shield yourself from the radiant heat and you hope that it shields you from enough heat that you can survive. Um, using things like gutters again, what you're trying to do is get yourself protected from the line of that radiant heat. Um, that is the key, the key issue for us. This house is pretty well prepared for bushfire in this sort of area. They're a member of community fire guard group and they've really broken down their preparedness into three different levels. The first thing they're going to expect to find is they're going to get a lot of smoke from a fire in the area and then embers, those bits of burning bark, are going to start landing around their house. Um, and they've got a number of ways that they're going to plan to deal with embers that are landing around. First of all, they've thought about where embers are going to be going and they're going to be blown by the wind against the wall. And you can see they've put shutters on their windows. So anything that hits the wall isn't going to lodge anywhere. It's just going to fall down upon the ground. Um, what they've else got, you see around the corners here, they've got just an old paint can, nothing terribly expensive, mm -hmm. with water in it, a bucket and a mop, because you don't need a helicopter or anything else like that to put out, um, put out an ember. You can put it out with a damp handkerchief as long as you're there. So they've got reliable, independent water there that they can, get you, they can, they can use to put out embers as they arrive. Those embers are going to be landing on this decking, and so they thought, well, I need to make sure this decking doesn't ignite either. And if you look up, you can see behind you here, oh, wow. um, they've got a sprinkler system, which is going to saturate this decking and the area around the house. And you see, they've not put the sprinkler system down the hill in the fuel, because they know they're not trying to fight forest fire. That's what we're trying to do. What these guys are trying to do is stop the ignition of a house fire. They're not going to go any further than that. So what they've got is all around the house, you'll find there's these sprinklers. Now, the thing is, a lot of people rely upon mains water to try and get things going and so on. And this area, that's not reliable. Well, we haven't got mains water here anyway. But also, with a fire in the area, your phone's going to go off and your electricity's going to go off, which means that if you're pulling water with an electric pump, all of a sudden, you haven't got any water at all. It's sitting in your tank and you can look at it and feel very happy about it, but you're not getting it out anywhere. So they've got an independent pump as well next to their tanks. Um, and that's what's going to be running this lot of stuff as well. Um, if we want to take a walk further around, um, we might have a look at how they've modified the fuel around their house, their house um, to make things um, sort of safer. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. See, even here, um, this is a wood pile, except they've enclosed it, so embers can't get to it. It's boxed up, all their kindling, paper, stuff like that, so there's nothing easily ignitable there. The wall, recently painted, so nothing can stick to it. It's just basic upkeep of their house and various things like that. If we continue on rounds, you can see in front of us here, there's a hose, a hose with enough length to go either way around the house. Um, again, they've got, as we'll see further down, um, these fittings, of course, are plastic, and what they know is when the fire actually gets here, those embers have been landing and smoke, and they've been putting them out for a while, but as the fire gets here, they know they can't stay outside because that heat's going to be given off pretty rapidly. So they have to go inside their house, but they know they can't leave this outside because, of course, they're going to melt their fitting, and they'll mm -hmm. come back out and they can't use their hose anymore. So they'll take this hose and their equipment indoors with them. Um, and you can even see, in fact, behind us here on the tank, on their hot water system, oh, to wow. start the house sprinkler system. So everyone in the house knows how to get this going. Their kids, their parents, and none of them, they tell their friends what's going on when they have people coming up here. Um, if we want to walk around, um, we'll have a look at where else embers might be going that um, they're prepared for. You can see on the windows here, there's a fly screen and it's a wire fly screen. Um, a lot of people pull up the sort of polyester, sort of plasticky fly screen, but of course when an ember hits that, it'll melt it. Mm -hmm. Whereas this sort of fly screen, it's keeping embers from lodging in the corners of the windows there, and it also actually shields you very well from radiant heat. It absorbs a lot of the heat. Again, embers will fall onto the ground where they can be easily put out. Even the way they've landscaped their garden, you might look at the garden and say, my God, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in the garden. But you can see nothing's continuous. You've got a tree, then there's bricks and gravel. You've got grass, then there's more gravel. You've got a shrub. There's not a continuous layer of fuel across here. So a fire can't just accelerate through this to them. Um, these things will catch embers, which is great, but there's not enough here to really let the fire get going because they keep the ground pretty clear of fuel. You can see the buckets and mops are in all corners of the house. 
Um, but a lot of the spaces that people forget, you can see they've sealed their eaves. So there's no gaps the embers can get into in the roof because, you know, something starts in the roof, that's pretty hard to manage. What they've done with the eaves, they've literally just blocked it with wood, uh -huh. uh, chiseled it to shape, so that any ember that gets, is blown in here at force is not going to get into the roof space. It's still just going to, gravity's going to take over and it's going to land again. There's nothing in the roof. There's no gaps in the roof for an ember to get into. And the final sort of thing about where embers are going, there's sort of two places. This house is on stilts. And you can see underneath. They've put AC sheeting uh -huh. underneath, so embers can't get underneath the house all the way around. Oh, wow. It's totally enclosed all the way around, mm -hmm. um, so nothing can get under the house either. So that's their experience of embers. Um, what also is happening, though, is something else they can do. These downpipes here, they used to collect their rainwater. They can turn them off at the tank, which means they can just fill with one switch they can fill up all the gutters in their house with water so that when that ember lands, it's just landing in water anyway. And that's just that's a very simple thing for them to be able to do. If we think about the next stage they're going to have, that's going to be as the fire actually gets here, um, which is going to look pretty in interesting from here, in all honesty. We've got all that tea tree we were talking about before on a slope. Um, fire is going to be moving quite rapidly up this slope. And the height of the flames is going to be quite significant. They're going to remember it for a while, but they're expecting this. But what they've done is they've kept that about 20 metres back from the house, mm -hmm. and then it's short grass. And we know that that fire, though it's going to be pretty good looking down there, when it gets that short grass, the height of the flames is going to drop right down because the grass is only that tall. The amount of heat energy that fire is putting out is going to drop hugely because there's no fuel. And though a fire will burn up the hill towards the house, they can control that very, very easily. And the risk of their house burning down from that is very little. That might take five or ten minutes to pass them. And what they'll be doing then is inside, they're not sitting down with their feet up having a drink or a coffee or anything like that. They'll be drinking water, obviously. And they'll be patrolling from room to room because they need information coming in. They need to know when is it safe for me to come out again because they don't want to stay in the house any longer than they have to. They want to be back outside putting out embers, putting out spot fires, checking the gutters. So they'll be inside patrolling from room to room. As that fire front passes them, they will then come back outside again with their mops and they'll patrol their house saying, OK, is that beam of light? No, it's not. And they'll put out anything that's burning around their house. They'll keep doing that for about six hours because we know our experience in 1983 um, a majority of the houses that burnt down, burnt down after the fire front had been through, not at the front of the fire at all. It was the embers that, those bits of bark we were looking at before, they keep coming for hours after the fire has been here. This landscape would be entirely different. The shrubs would be gone, the ground would be white, you'll have just the remnant trees left over, and then the embers continuing to land for hours and hours and hours. So they're ready for a, a long haul, in essence, but they're ready and they know what they're going to experience. I'm amazed by the similarities between the United States and Australia's firefighting systems. There is some interesting twists though, like the CFA's community volunteer based system. That really works good for them. Community fire guard too. There's some really positive ideas there with proactive responses to public emergencies. Think of how that could be used worldwide with earthquakes, floods and hurricanes. I really like the idea too of not relying on fancy safety equipment, but instead to think ahead and plan and not put yourself there in the first place. Believe me, there's no sticks out there worth any of our lives. God, this has been a really long, hot trip, and I think it's time for a swim.
We're doing this for all of you. If you like what we're doing, please give us a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment below. See you next time.